Right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this session is a change in course, BC206, uh, Ministry of the Evangelist, Teacher, and Pastor. All right. So let's pray. We begin this class. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time, O oh God, even as we get into studying about a different course, about the ministry of the evangelist, pastor, and teacher, Lord. Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will, Lord, continue, Lord, to just sow your seeds in our heart, in our spirit, O oh God, that everything that we are learning, O oh God, we will be able to apply it and use it in our lives, O oh God. We pray that you will guide us during this time of learning, O oh Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So last class we did uh, chapter 3, the evangelist in the early church. Uh, uh, some of the pointers we picked up was uh, the title of the evangelist, uh, what it means, uh, and also uh, Philip. We looked at Philip as the evangelist and how he was... Uh, you know, wherever he went, he was able to, you know, minister to people. So he he was he's the only person in the New Testament uh, who has been mentioned as the evangelist. All right, so let's get into chapter four. The restoration of the ministry of the evangelist. Now, why does it say restoration? Uh, where, where What went wrong? Uh, we, we studied in the early church. There was a lot of evangelists and evangelism that was happening in the early church. But why, why was there need of a restoration? What does it mean to restore? Something that was, it went in a different direction, but now we're restoring it back to what it was, its earlier state. Now, if you look at history, if you read history, there are a lot of you know, the church went through a lot of changes, right? And, and these changes caused a lot of differences when it comes to the fivefold ministry, the functioning of the church, right? Uh, so over time, the work of the evangelist had almost come to a stop, right? Uh, the, it, it had almost come to a stop. There was there was no evangelism. There were no people going out, reaching out, bringing people to Christ. There was no sharing of the gospel as such. But look, let's look at how the restoration of this ministry, the ministry of the evangelist, how, how did God restore it? Who did he use? Now, in this chapter, there are a lot of, uh, there are names, but there are also a lot of, uh, you know, uh, denominations that we may use. Uh, but don't be worried about, you know, understanding what the denomination is. But we, what we want to do in this chapter is to try and get an overview of how the, the ministry of the evangelist was restored. Now, you see this. The earliest church historian states that occupying the first steps in succession from the apostles set out on journeys from home and performed the work of the evangelist and preached to such as had not yet heard the word of faith. Right? So Eusebius was one of the earliest church historians. So what did he do? He went into places that the gospel was not shared. Right? So he didn't look at places that were already the gospel was there or the church, the work of the ministry was there. He went into new places, set out journeys from home and performed the work of the evangelist in places where the word of faith had not yet been preached. Right? Then there's another person named Pantantius of Alexandria who journeyed as far as India. So now we know that Thomas did come into India. The apostle, uh, Jesus' disciple, did come into India, uh, the south of India. Uh, but there was only so much that he could do, right? He planted the seed, but there was a lot of work to be done. Right now, if you look at our nation, uh, it's a big nation. There's a lot of work. And so uh, Pantanius of uh, Alexandria journeyed as far as India, being one of the many evangelists of the word after the manner of the apostles. The ministry of this of the evangelist is evidenced in succession of the now here are these people, the different groups of people who brought about the restoration 
of the ministry of the evangelist. Uh, the, the succession of the Bogomils, the, I, I'm sure you have heard of the Hissites, the Lollards, the Puritans, the Methodists. The Puritans, have you heard of the Puritans? Uh, these are different groups, right? Again, this is early church history, right? Uh, these are groups that people you God used, and within these groups, people were raised up as evangelists, and they went out preaching the gospel. Right now, Puritans, Methodists were one of the most famous when it came to the the work of the evangelists. Right when it came to the Methodists, we have the great uh, John and Charles Wesley who did a great work. Uh, uh, we have George Whitefield again who did a wonderful ministry, just uh, going out to different parts of the of uh, of America, and 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 you know most of it was moving from place to place, uh, preaching the gospel. Right. Then we have the Presbyterians and the Baptists. So after the Dark Ages, after during these during the times when there was not much of ministry that was happening, the, the ministry of the evangelists, God used these groups. And within these groups, he raised up evangelists who went about preaching the gospel. Uh, one of them here is a Hussite evangelist from Bohemia who is no, only known as Peter was burned at the stake in Scotland for his ministry. Now, as the church kept uh, from the early church, as the church uh, came down, many, many persecutions happened. Persecutions during the Dark Ages were so, so intense that we cannot even think about it. Christians were thrown into lion parks, right? Meaning uh, they were they were devoured by lions. They were made to go fight against lions. Families were put in, in uh, you know, it became a form of entertainment. Right? Uh, martyrdom of Christians became a form of entertainment, especially in Rome, in the Greek, Greek uh, Greco world, um, Asia. It became a form of entertainment. And they've just mentioned one evangelist here, but there are plenty of evangelists and ministers of God who gave their life, who were martyred for the sake of the gospel. Right? So what is this lesson that we can learn from this? You know, if, if we study church history, now, did we do revivals, visitations, and moves of God? Only done it. So you have a kind of a brief overview of what happened in uh, church history. So when God used these people, they went through intense persecution, but God also, the, sowed, the seeds that were sown began to bear fruit. Uh, I'll just give you this example. It's not in your notes, but in Cambodia, in the early 1940s, Cambodia, God, you know, God established... Uh, and raised up leaders who gave, and gave them a heart for Cambodia. Now, Cambodia was a place which was highly, um, you know, uh, 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 mostly had people from different faiths, and it was a highly persecuted place. Right? But it was it was also low in poverty. There was there was um, diseases prevalent. Children were uh, not fed well. Houses, infrastructure, everything was bad in this place, Cambodia. And what happened was God raised up, a, 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 I think they, I, I'm guessing, I, I think it was the from the Baptist group where God raised up these evangelists and a group of people went into Cambodia. This was in 1942. They went in, they began to evangelize. And for about 20 years, they did ministry there. But they, did, they saw very less fruit in 20 years. Then there was a lot of militants that happened. Uh, you know, they were the, the evangelists were chased out of that place. Christianity again went through uh, intense persecution, and in the early 80, 1980s, again God raised up leaders and sent them evangelists and sent them to Cambodia, and then Cambodia became one of the most responsive countries in the entire world. The people began to see the fruit of the seeds that were sown. Evangelists were sent in great numbers into Cambodia. 
people started giving their life to Christ. People were coming to the thousands to, for meetings. Right it, it, in church history, it says that in Cambodia, if any evangelist, it didn't matter whether he's famous or not, if there were church meetings, there would be thousands of people. The problem was to how to handle these thousands of people coming into the church, coming into the uh, church meetings. Hundreds of people would come in front to give their life to Christ each day, each meeting. Cambodia became one of the most responsive countries in the world. A few years later, India joined that group. India became some of the most one of the most responsive countries in the world, where many evangelists came in from different parts of the world, and not only in India, but uh, that many people began to give their lives to Christ because of the work of the evangelists. Right. So God had a way of restoring. He used people from different communities: Methodists. Hussites, Puritans, Presbyterians, Baptists. He used people from different groups of uh, or different denominations, raised up people with a heart for God, and used them as great evangelists, bringing a reformation and the work of the ministry of the evangelist. Right? So let's go on here. Excel, uh, uh, Bible illustrator says, an evangelist was the founder of new churches and the stimulator of existing ones. So we saw that. Remember, we talked about the role of the evangelist. An evangelist can also start new churches and also build existing churches. And that's what they did in the uh, when it came to the restoration of uh, the evangelist. Uh, Reese states that the ministry of the apostle and the evangelist was very similar and adds that his office was of geographical nature, whose job was to preach the word sometimes in several locations. So when you look at the apostle, what does the word apostle mean? Apostle means? No, what does the word apostle mean? Apostle means? The sent one. The sent sent one. one. Yes. Sent one. So here, uh, Excel, the uh, uh, Bible illustrator says, and uh, an apostle and an evangelist have very similar functions because both are sent out, sent out to preach sometimes uh, in the same place, sometimes in many different places. Uh, the evangelists were itinerant preachers. Right now, uh, we see a few examples there. William Taylor was uh, uh, was again uh, an evangelist. They went forth to various churches in order to preach the gospel and perfect the work which had been begun by the apostles. So you see a hand in hand going uh, with these two gifts, especially the apostle and the evangelist, both going hand in hand. The apostle can plant a church and the evangelist can come in and bring strength to the church. An evangelist also can plant a church and an apostle can come to build and to equip that church, right? And all of this happened during a time when they did not understand. Now, remember, we understand what is evangelism. We understand how to go about doing evangelism. These people didn't have a book. They didn't have an understanding. All they knew is we got to go out, preach the gospel, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, it's not in your notes here, but uh, uh, Adoniram Judson, right? And then we'll go into the other examples here also. God used Adoniram Judson in a very, very powerful way. There was a young man. Judson was a young man when he was eight years old. Right? Just a little bit of history. When he was eight years old, he was teaching children's church from the original Greek on the book of Revelations. Right? He was a brilliant man. Right, and and he joined Yale University, and God used him to get into Persia. He went into Persia, he planted, did the work of the evangelist there. He went into many places in Persia, planting churches, preaching the gospel, planting churches, raising up leaders, and then from Persia he goes into Burma, right? In Burma he begins to do ministry there. He he spent many time, many years in Burma trying to learn the language. After learning the language, it took many years for him to get his first believer. 
But all of this happened because you have a heart for God. All of this can happen because you want to see the work of the ministry. Right? Sometimes, uh, you know, when we when we think of the evangelist, we look at it as okay, somebody who goes out, ministers to people, comes back. Not always so. In a day and age that we are living in, we want fruit immediately. Right? You feel that okay, I go out, I preach, yet many people come to Christ. And then I move out and I just continue to do that. People should call me. People should invite me. Yes, there's a time for that. But there is also a time for where you will have to be responsible for the growth of these believers. right? And, and, and God used this man so powerfully. right? By the late 4th and 5th centuries, it is, we see the roving ministry of the evangelist. right? There were many, many evangelists that God used. John Wycliffe. Uh, uh, Peter Waldo, uh, George Whitfield, right? Uh, again, John and Charles Wesley. Let's look at George Whitfield. How many of you have heard of George Whitfield? Some of them pronounce it Whitfield, some of them say Whitefield, uh, but it's George Whitfield. Uh, he crossed the Atlantic Ocean 13 times and became the first field preacher since the Lollards 400 years before. Now, look at what it is. It was said on a clear day and, a, and the wind blowing right, he could be understood a mile away. He would preach to between five to 50,000 people. Thousands of people were saved under his ministry. You know, George Whitfield, if you go back, you can go to Google, read about George Whitfield. You know, when he preached, it, it, you know, some of them said it sounded like a thousand trumpets blowing. There was no mic system, there was no speakers, there was no, you know, uh, monitors, nothing. Just standing and preaching of the gospel. And his voice was so loud that it sounded like a thousand trumpets. And he preached between five to 50,000 people, bringing them to Christ. God used this man, George Whitfield, in a very powerful way. And most of his ministry was moving from place to place on horseback. Now, we must understand, there were places where there was, you know, history says that, you know, there were snow up to knee height. So they had to wait, wait for the snow to melt off. There was no Google Maps. So they had to find a way. There was no proper food. There was no proper shelter. Most of these evangelists sacrificed when it came to stay, or, or when it came to many, many evangelists lost their lives with diseases and sicknesses because they didn't have enough, enough money, they didn't have enough uh, resources to look after themselves. But what did they do? 55 to 50,000 people George Whitfield ministered to. Then you have John and Charles Wesley through their preaching helped save England from a bloodbath at the end of the 18th century. They saved these two brothers, John and Charles Wesley, saved an entire nation by preaching of the gospel. What did they do? Because during that time, it, it was going to be a, a, the, one of the most bloodiest times in the 18th century was going to be, you know, it is actually even now it is known as one of the most bloodiest times in church history or in history. Millions of people killed. John and Charles Wesley. John traveled more than 100,000 miles on horseback. 100,000 miles on horseback during those days. Preaching at least three times a day and was responsible for starting the Methodist denomination. Now, imagine on horseback, going from place to place, preaching the gospel. What is it that stirred these people up. Why would they give up so much for the sake of the gospel? He appointed Francis Asbury to be his successor. successor. Asbury rode horseback over 200,000 miles and preached more than 20,000 sermons. Jacob Knapp, in the, first, uh, in the first third of the 19th century, became the first of a long-time Baptist evangelist. 
So when we see this, many people were used by God. And these people were used powerfully as evangelists. Remember, they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have money. They didn't have the resources. But they were able to do everything that God had you know, put in their hearts. And if you, if I go on, I, I, I'm getting a lot of names of these wonderful ministers of God. But God used all these wonderful, wonderful men of God, simple men, simple men and women of God who came and did the work of the ministry. Think about William Carey, right? How many of you have heard of David Livingston? You must read about David Livingston. Really, the man was such a piece of, you know, God used him so powerfully. When he was a young man, God put the nation of Africa into his heart. He said, I want to go into Africa. He goes into Africa. He begins to do the ministry, right? He begins to evangelize into, in many places in Africa. There were times he just escaped from wild animals, from bears and tigers, and um, he he was beaten by people. He was put into, uh, you know, uh, prison, and he came back for some time. He got married. After his marriage, he he told his wife, "Something is wrong. I have to go back to Africa." And so, he goes back to Africa. He does the work of the ministry there, speaking to many, many thousands of people. He ministers to thousands of people. Many of them give their life to Christ. He does a great ministry there, but he falls sick. And he, 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 you know, he needs these medicines and all of these. Uh, his, his body was going through such deformity. Then he decided, I need a break. I need to go back. He goes back after five years. His own wife sees him coming, doesn't recognize him, and begins to. she falls on the ground and begins to weep. He says, what has happened to you? His face was marred because he was attacked by bears. His collarbone was poking out. His, his bones, he was, just, he was just flesh, and he was just you know nothing, just bones. His wife falls to the ground and weeps and says, what has happened to you? He stays there for some time, but he says, I need to go back. I need to go back to Africa. They are there. They are waiting for me. His wife says, don't do it. You, I don't think you're going to come back. He says, but his wife says, okay, go, because that's where your heart is. Your heart is for Africa. Go. So his wife sends him, says, okay, go. And his wife knew that this could be the last time he would see them, see him. By that time, he had two small children. Right? He hugged his wife, he hugged his children and said, I'll come back and see you. And he goes back to Africa. And this, you know, he begins to do a great ministry. Many churches were planted under his ministry. Many people gave their lives to Christ. But towards the end of his life, right, um, he needed the medicines. And, uh, you know, most of the medicines were sent from the West, right? So either America or the, uh, and it, it would come into Africa. And so, there was this one time he was sitting and uh, praying, and he said, God, if I don't get my medicines, I'm going to die. Right? And so uh, he was praying. And this is a real story, right? Uh, so what happens was he, he's, he's praying there. He's saying, God, I need my medicines, or I'm going to die. And at that moment, there was a knock at the door. And there was this uh, you know, TV reporter who was sent from America to come to Africa to do a to be with David Livingston to see his ministry and write a report of the entire ministry that he's doing in Africa. So he knocks on the door and he says, uh, David Livingston opens the door and says, "Who are you? What do you want?" He says, "My name is this. I've come from this news channel. I'm supposed to stay with you for the next six months, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to write about your ministry so that we can." You know, let everyone in uh, back home know what kind of ministry you're doing. Uh, so two things. One is this is your medicines, which they have sent. And take your medicines. So immediately he took the medicine. Secondly, he says, I am the biggest atheist that you can ever find. So don't try sharing the gospel with me. Right? 
And so David Livingston and this person, this journalist, go about and you know doing he David Livingston goes about in all over Africa doing ministry and the journalist is along with him. And three months down the line, this journalist gives his life to Christ because he sees the work of the ministry. He said, Nobody can do what they're doing, what you are doing, where you're ready to give your own life for some person who you haven't seen. Either you're gone out of your mind, you're mad, or Jesus, the God you're worshipping is the real God. And he's, he knew David Livingston was a brilliant person, so you're not mad. The God that you're worshipping is the true God. And then this way, David Livingston spread the gospel all across Africa. He brought revivals in Africa. He brought in the reading of the word, the ministry of the word. He brought in the whole ministry of the gift of faith and uh, working of uh, and the uh, you know the the gifts of the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, the working of the gifts of the Holy Spirit into Africa. And when he died, you know he went back to uh, his hometown where he died. When he died, they said we. They, take, they took out his heart and they buried it in Africa because his heart was there. God used these great men for the restoration of the work of the evangelist. The fact that you and I can talk about the work of evangelism, and talk about what God, is do, what God is doing is because of these people who sacrificed. In our nation, we have people like William Carey, who came, did a great work here in India. We have people like, you know, of the recent, we have Graham Staines, who came with his family, Gladys Staines and children. Even though they were martyred, Gladys Staines stayed back and said, no, I need to be here, do the work of the ministry, which my husband did. The church would not be as strong as it was today if not for the ministry of these God-called evangelists. Do you think the ministry, especially in the nation of India, right? Uh, do you think it would have happened just by its own? No. God raised up these wonderful men and women of God. Many of them gave their life to Christ. Do you know that one, I think it was, uh, I, I was reading about the Kandamal, uh, uh, there's this book, and I keep mentioning the book, but I forget the name of the book. Uh, it talks about the the outcome of the Kandamal persecutions, right? And um, after Graham Staines and his wife, uh, uh, sorry, Graham Staines and the children were uh, mercilessly burnt in the jeep uh, at night, uh, the entire country, like especially the nation, was in shock. How can this happen? How can this happen to people who came to, you know, help us? Right? They were medical missionaries. They wanted to also help in terms of medicine and help. They were helping people and sharing the gospel. How can this happen? And you know, when we we, we re I read a lot of articles, and uh, one thing is mentioned. There was a huge, large group of people who went to burn that jeep, right? And in that. I think it was two or three of them. I could be, I'm not sure of the number, but it's either two or three of them who later on became believers because they saw Gladys Stain standing in front of the press and saying, I forgive those who did this. I have nothing against them. And she began to weep or in the media, in front of the media. I have nothing against them. God is the judge. God is going to. I miss my husband. I miss my children. But God is the judge. I have forgiven them because that's what Christ's love is. That impacted these people so much that they said, This is something different. They gave their lives to Christ. If you read about the whole of the Kandamal persecutions, God raised up many, many, many evangelists. God raised up many, many local churches. You know what the. I love that verse. What the enemy means for evil, God will turn for good. Enemy meant I'll, I'll go all guns blazing against Christians in the city of Kandamar. Yes, there were lives lost. There was uh, persecution. There was so much of grief. 
children were killed, family members were killed, but the outcome was that church only began to grow. God raised up many, many, many more people. The persecutors became like Apostle Paul, became the preachers. The persecutors stood for the sake of the gospel. And it came a time where, you know, it went up to the government, like people in government said, we cannot do what, we cannot repeat what has happened here. We need to give them their freedom, right? And, and so Christianity took a stand, especially in that state of Orissa, right? There will be persecution. There was persecution, but Christianity took a stand. D.L. Moody, right? Uh, sorry, there's one more. Charles Finney became an evangelist. Uh, uh, in Rochester, New York, as one of the most desirable cities in the New United States in which to live in because the revival took place under the uh, evangelist Charles Finney. D.L. Moody was another great evangelist. He shook two continents for God by the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving a legacy of the Moody Bible Institute. Let me tell you something about D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody... As a young man, he hated the name of God. He hated everything about God. But uh, as he grew up, he very marvelously he came to Christ, and he was working in uh, in the sugarcane fields, right? And this one time, he began to share the gospel with people, and it is said that everywhere he went, he began to share the gospel that he wouldn't rest his head at night if he did not share the gospel. He was a person who would always depend on the work of the Holy Spirit. Billy Sunday, uh, again a great evangelist, was used by God to fight the liquor industry more than any other person in human history. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. influenced a whole generation of Jesus. And, and then there are so many other evangelists, tele-evangelists, uh, R.A. Torrey, Evan Roberts, Sam Jones, Gypsy Smith, Billy Graham, A.A. Uh, A. Allen, all these wonderful evangelists God used to restore the work of the ministry. Then came the healing evangelist. Is the one who, a healing evangelist is one who preaches the gospel and also demonstrates the spiritual power of healing, spiritual uh, of healing, Proclaiming the power, the resurrection, the death, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So basically, what they would do is uh, they would preach the gospel and say, "Now, if any of you have any kind of sickness, come forward, or you know, just raise up your hand. They're going to pray for healing over you." So this happened. Uh, by Amy's, uh, Amy McPherson in the early 1920s was the first American healing evangelist that God used. Amy, uh, Amy Semple McPherson, uh, and these, how many of you have seen these videos of the early 1940s? You know, it is so powerful to watch it, because nowadays we don't see that much happening, because, uh, especially uh, the ones that I've seen is a, a little bit of Oral Roberts and A. A. Allen, yes, right, the way they would just you know, they would preach the gospel, very simple message, 20 minutes, preach the gospel. But the way that they would flow in the healing anointing was just on a different level. Uh, I, I think you can go online and see uh, on YouTube, you, we have a couple of videos on Oral Roberts and also A.A. Uh, A. Allen, uh, Billy Graham, of course. So the way they ministered in healing. A. A. Allen, you know, people would come in wheelchairs. And it's very interesting, right? Just the just the flow, the anointing, the the confidence that they would minister in. They would bring people in wheelchairs and stretchers, and uh, both A. L. and Oral Roberts. They would say, uh, "Do you want? So, are you ready to get healed?" And they would ask the person, uh, "Yes, I'm ready to get healed." So, who's going to heal you? Jesus is going to heal me. What are you going to stand for? After you get healed, what are you going to do? Yeah, I'm going to stand. I'm going to uh, proclaim the gospel. I'm going to uh, you know, uh, do the work of the ministry. So they were so confident that God would bring healing. Right? And when I see those videos, I think to myself, God, why not us? 
They were so confident. Just maybe in your break time, just go to just type in AA Allen and see his videos. You say, okay, are you ready to get healed? Are you ready to go home healed? Are you ready for you know? And they would be people who uh, you know have some cancer, and some of them have brain diseases, some of them have all kinds of diseases. Uh, some of them are paralyzed head to toe. Are you ready to get healed? Yes. He prays over them, simple prayer. They get up, they walk home. This became a great restoration in the work of the ministry. Imagine this. When they had these, you know, during those days, they had tent meetings, right? So they would pitch their tents in a certain place. They would have the meeting that thousands of people would come. For these meetings, thousands. Right? How did how did it happen? God made that restoration. People began to understand that these evangelists are anointed by God. God began to use them so powerfully. People came. They were received the gospel. They received salvation. They received healing, both in their body and their spirit. Lives were changed, and the church, the body of Christ, just began to grow. Right, and so even when we see tele evangelists, we got T.L. Osborne, Renard Bonke, Benny Hinn, Pat Robertson, Jimmy Swaggart. God used these people as evangelists to just multiply and grow the work of the ministry. Now, God may ask some of us, God may choose some of us, say, Go and do it. Remember, these all of these people were simple people. God does not choose the qualified. We've heard that saying, right? He chooses those who are ready. Right? God does not. God doesn't always look at, you know. Um, uh, he says, right? His word says, "Be faithful and small. I'll give you the more. I'll give you more." Right? So you, you, you and I are to be faithful in the small things. God will give us much more. Right? So yes. Uh, we've heard of the Methodist, uh, Baptist, and Presbyterians, but uh, to this day. Uh, uh, do these groups of uh, Lollards, Puritans, do they exist? Because I've never heard um, them. I know that the Puritans exist, but I didn't look into the Lollards. I'm not sure about that. But the Puritans do exist. The Baptists, of course, do exist. Uh, but most of the groups do exist. And out of it have come offshoot groups. Or offshoot, meaning from these groups. People have moved out and started their own kind of groups and own kind of uh, with their own names and all of that. So, the reason, so for example, John and Charles Wesley, uh, I haven't really gone into who came up with the name Methodist, but the word, the reason they were called Methodist is that they were extremely methodical. Like John Wesley was extremely methodical. He was a person who was very high intellect, so he wanted certain things to be done in a certain way. And uh, you know, history says that apparently he would uh, he would tell Charles, his brother, you know, to lead the worship, and they both were in uh, university. So he would tell Charles Wesley, "You lead the worship," and he would choose the songs for him. And sometimes they would have a rift between each other. But they somehow they stayed together. So he was very very methodical, and he was uh, extremely dedicated uh, to what he was doing. Uh, extreme dedication. So these people, all of these evangelists that God used, were extremely dedicated. But the groups, per se, or maybe there are many other that have come up. But the Methodists, the main line ones still remain, Methodists, Baptists. And the interesting thing is they still have those in their roots. Right? Methodists and the Baptists, they have it in their roots where you know go out, evangelize. It's still there. Um, I wouldn't say all all churches, but that's something that is very integral. Very, it's a part of their ministry. So, um, and so yeah, so God has used all of these people and many many others. Now we talked about those whom we know. There were many people, significant, insignificant. God has used as evangelists to uh, reform and to restore the work of the ministry. Uh, the evangelist, right? So just a few things here. Uh, practical keys, or wh what we'll do is we'll go into this next class because there are seven points. There's a lot we can discuss on this. 
So we'll stop here. We'll go to chapter five next class. We'll look at uh, the practical keys to doing the ministry of the evangelist. And there are a lot of uh, points that we can talk about, discuss on this. Right? Uh, any questions? Uh, pertaining to the previous uh, class that we discussed, uh, now there are a lot of church groups and other things that we think. But how do we uh, sometimes try to avoid? I'm not taking any names, but just back of the mind, like some cult churches that are like you know uh, uh, there. So uh, uh, if I if I'm wrong, uh, pardon me, but uh, somewhere back of the mind, whether it is the Seventh Day Adventist, whether it is. Uh, uh, yeah, any other groups, so yes. uh, how do you actually know that is a cult church and uh, refrain okay. from I would say this way anything that is not in line with the doctrine of God's word becomes a cult anything if a group of people say I don't I, I, I believe only in Jesus sorry only in God the Father Right? It becomes a cult. If there's a group that says, I believe only in Jesus, I don't believe in Father and Holy Spirit, it becomes a cult. If there's a group that says, uh, you know, I don't believe, I believe in everything, but I don't believe that, uh, you know, Jesus rose again from the dead, example, it becomes a cult. So the way to recognize is to understand what they are teaching and what they are preaching. Now, they may have different ways of doing church. right? So some of them may meet on a Saturday evening. Just because they meet on a Saturday doesn't mean they're a cult. Some of them may meet on a, another day of the week. Doesn't mean that they may meet in the evenings. But the best way to know is, are they in line with God's word? This is your foundation. Yeah. Right? Anywhere, if you see, for example, uh, there's a group of people, I forget who the, what their um, you know, name of the group is, because I try not to go too much in, but there's a group of people who believe that uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit ended with the Apostle Paul. Right? Uh, so there's a group there. Right? So, so now they may have everything right, and this is wrong. Usually, remember, a cult is... Again, we should also remember a uh, cult is normally a one man or one person leading organization, dictatorial, right? dictatorial, like one person leading and he has complete control. That is very cultish. Now, you may have churches which don't uh, believe in you know, certain things because the understanding is wrong, but they may be, they may have teams, they may have, they may work together as a team. So, the best way to know is just go back and see. Online churches, uh, like uh, uh, it's one way. It is better to refrain, but uh, don't we have that type of you know authority or uh, uh, way to just stop uh, these type of uh, things that you know unknowingly people just follow or just like land up in that uh, uh, thing? Yeah. So, so the thing is, see, what's happened is with this structure and organization coming in, people have focused too much towards that. And they've forgotten or they've put preaching of the word and ministry second place. So what's happened is, so for example, if you take some of the mainline, and I don't want to name them, but some of the mainline churches, for them, organization is more important than the, than the work of the ministry. Organization should be right. Everything, pastor, associate pastor. But what are, what about lives touch, lives impact? Maybe they're doing it. I'm not saying they're not. Uh, so the the one of the ways to it's again it all, it all comes to leadership. If you have a right leader, the church will start to change. Right now, if the leader again is somebody who's wavering, who's not interested, doing all kinds of things, living a sinful life, he's not going to be interested in the spiritual things. And sad to say, um, and I'll close with this thought. Many years ago, I had to meet uh, a pastor in here in Bangalore, and he was a pastor from the one of the mainline churches. So 
I had to meet him regarding something. I don't remember for what, but I went to his office. And uh, when I went to his office, I entered the office. I was shocked. Because the moment I entered, I got alcohol smell. I thought, okay, maybe it's a perfume smell. But I knew somewhere this is something wrong. So then I went and, uh, and I sat with him. His eyes were puffed up red. And right there, there was a small table, and he stacked up liquor bottles. And he's talking to me. What are we talking about? We're talking about uh, getting together to do some, I think it was some conference or something that we wanted to do. He's agreeing to everything that I'm saying. And somewhere amid that conversation, I said, I'm not even going to talk. Right? And he's the leader of the entire church. My heart sank right, when I saw that. Uh, now, why isn't anyone saying anything? We don't know. It's a huge church. Maybe 3,000 odd people. Right? They have structure. Right? They have an office, pastoral thing, pastoral house. They have a car which comes, picks them up, picks up the pastor. When I saw that, my heart sank. And I thought to myself, where are we headed? How can he be a person? How can he, what is he going to minister to the people? And I told him, uh, I remember telling him at that moment, I think we'll drop the plan. I don't know if he understood what I was saying because he was already, you know, under the influence. Uh, then he said something and I just shrugged my shoulder and I just went off. I just thought, what is this? He's leading a group of 3,000 people. And there are youth, there are young people, there are families who are going through challenges, there are, there are youth who are going through things in their life. And he's going up every Sunday to preach the Word of God. The entire church knows, the administration, the leaders know what's happening. Nothing's being done. So sometimes we, we you know, that's the thing, right? The enemy infiltrates in certain ways, and we there's nothing much that they can do. So, but here's the thing: uh, as believers, and we must understand that hey, we have somebody that we have to give an account to. We will stand before the Lord one day to give an account. So we must be faithful in what God has called us to do. Do it the right way. Be faithful. Be good stewards of the Word of God. So, so we'll stop here and. Next class, we'll get into the evangelist practical keys to doing the ministry of the evangelist. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week ahead. I'll see you soon. God bless.